Hello, everyone, and welcome to day two, session two of Connections Online. Uh, today, uh, for this session, we're hoping to have five great speakers uh, on recent articles in wargaming. So all of us have um, published something in the, in the last recent bit that has caused uh, some interest and or flurry in the wargaming community, and we're looking to have some conversations about it. Uh, we've had some of those conversations in the in the words of those articles, and we're looking to have them, some of those conversations uh, with each other and hopefully with some of the questions from you guys as well out in the audience. So I'm hoping this is going to be a great, great conversation with the five of us here. So we've got Jennifer McCardle, Yuna Wong, Shane Billsborough, John Compton, and myself, Jeremy Sapinski. I'll be moderating the panel. Uh, uh, thankfully, uh, so all of these um, articles were written in War on the Rocks. Uh, so we've got some links up in the Discord chat for you to follow the, the articles that we're looking at so far. So, so hopefully, uh, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at those articles, you might, might go and take a look at them um, after this presentation is over. We're going to go in reverse order of uh, publication date. So, so those of us who happen to have thrown some rocks at some of the other folks uh, get a chance to get some rocks thrown at us over the course of the presentations here. After we each give a ten, about 10 minute presentation for each of the individuals on the line, uh, we are going to do some internal questions and some dialogues among our, amongst ourselves and then open it up to the uh, questions that are being raised by the Discord channel. So we're looking forward to having that conversation with you. So we're going to start with Jennifer McCardle. Jennifer. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, my piece was the most recent one to come out, so I've not had any rocks thrown at me yet, but I look forward to any projectiles you all want to throw my way uh, during Q&A. So let me see if I can share my screen. Let's see, hold on. Okay. All righty. Okay, so on September 15th, 1941, a special kind of war was declared. As a tropical storm sent torrential rain throughout the Gulf of Mexico, swelling rivers and kicking the ground in mud, 472,000 troops bivouacked between Shreveport and Lake Charles, Louisiana for the largest simulated force on force battle in US history. So September 15th was the start of the Louisiana maneuvers, a series of four exercises that took place over two separate venues, the Louisiana Texas border and the Carolinas. They were the denouement of the US Army's pre-war mobilization in the lead into World War II. And I'd argue that the maneuvers provide three enduring insights for us today, particularly as the US attempts um, to articulate a new American way of war to better meet the, uh, the needs of great power competition and combat. So the first is the need for personnel reform when confronted with a radically altered battlefield landscape. The second, the importance of mission-driven acquisitions to incorporate the best available private sector innovations in DOD. And the third is the game-changing role of simulation uh, to drive reform and change resistance bureaucracies. So I realize this conference is about wargaming. And I'm speaking about a series of large scale maneuvers in the inner war years, a series of experimentation and training exercises. Obviously, I think we all know that in many ways these are different things. Uh, when we think about Peter Perla's cycle of research, war games are highlighted as these you know, very effective tools to develop new insights that can subsequently feed into live experiments and feed into training where you have this iterative feedback loop. But as I pull out these lessons, I think it's going to become abundantly clear that they also apply to wargaming. At their core, wargames, much like the Louisiana maneuvers, can help to refine concepts and technological capabilities. When done well, wargames, through their immersive capacity, can acclimatize commanders to the complex and stress-inducing realities of the battlefield. War games also allow users to transcend their current realities, ideally helping them to question those known unknowns or those potentially very wicked unknown unknowns 
that may radically alter the battle space. So simulations of war, whether they're war games or experiments like the Louisiana maneuvers are key avenues to imagine and prepare for the contours of future conflict. So General George C. Marshall was sworn in as the US Army's Chief of Staff on September 1st, 1939, the same day that Germany invaded Poland, signaling the start of World War II. Marshall was profoundly conscious of the leadership failures of World War I, and he sought to ensure that those same mistakes would not be repeated. So with President Roosevelt's support, Marshall devised a scheme whereby certain underperforming indiv uh, senior indiv officers would be winnowed from the ranks. So field exercises, in particular the Louisiana maneuvers, were at the heart of that process. Personnel reform would be driven by infield performance. So to do this, Marshall put a heavy emphasis on fidelity. He sought to mimic the demands and intensity of future European or Asian theaters without the use of live ammunition. So loudspeakers were carted onto the battlefield to reproduce the sounds of battle. Smoke canisters shrouded the battlefield in a thick haze to stress commanders and warfighters. Aircraft and cannons employed flower bags to simulate munitions. And the idea was that general officers that flourished under these conditions, they'd be singled out for future promotion. So future military giants such as Eisenhower and Patton, they first gained acclaim during the Louisiana maneuvers before achieving renown in combat in World War II. So Marshall's emphasis on fidelity is interesting because it ties into an important debate about the types of fidelity that are important when experimenting or training, whether it's simulation fidelity, physical fidelity, functional fidelity, or psychological fidelity. And what, at least the training community, and I'd argue it's the same with wargaming, what they've realized is what matters the most is psychological fidelity. So it's the degree to which a simulation, and that could be a live simulation, like the Louisiana maneuvers, prompt similar cognitive, behavioral, and effective responses relevant in a particular warfighting or decision-making setting. And we could definitely have a very rich debate about the degree to which war games draw out the same responses that you'd expect in a real decision-making environment. Um, but for the most part, well-designed war games are meant to create that same sort of psychological fidelity. And as a result, they also could prove to be very useful tools as the US starts to work starts to identify the types of leaders that may help us prevail in a protracted competition with China or Russia. So in early um, 1941, three aviation firms approached the army with an offer. The use of 11 of their club type sports planes flown by factory pilots for the summer maneuver season, all paid for by the manufacturers. The, the firms had hypothesized that their club type aircraft could support artillery spotting and liaison missions, and they thereby sought to encourage test and experimentation in the field. So called grasshopper planes during the maneuvers for their appearance when landing, these light liaison aircraft were an immediate test and experimentation success. They acted as very useful assets for intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, transport, and the direction of artillery fire. At about one-tenth the cost of a normal observation aircraft, they ended up being employed throughout the entirety of the maneuver se season, and they earned their own insignia, which was a flying grasshopper, casually smoking a cigarette. And you can see two of those images on the slide. I won't deny, I absolutely love that. Um, so the plane's performance during the Louisiana maneuvers inspired the War Department uh, to order six to ten aircraft for every Army division. Um, but interestingly, prior to the planes field test, some military aviators had expressed an aversion to the aircraft. They viewed the technology as obsolete compared to other contemporary and allegedly more cutting edge aircraft. So the agile grasshoppers, they ultimately deployed to Europe, largely because the army sought a mission driven platform agnostic solution to the air observation challenge. The grasshoppers demonstrated that they met a critical mission need. So this form of pragmatic bottom-up change runs counter to most acquisition policy today. The Department of Defense rarely releases mission-focused requirements or employs mission-driven competitions as the basis for acquisitions. 
So reforming the present acquisition system would require significant structural change, but expanding mission-driven capability and concept discovery opportunities to accommodate the grasshoppers of the future is really a useful first step. And war games can act as part of that discovery process, much like the Louisiana maneuvers did in the inner war years. So on May 25th, 1940, a group of army officers clandestinely gathered in a high school basement in Alexandria, Louisiana. The participants' goal was to separate tanks from the infantry and horse cavalry, thereby creating a separate mechanized branch like the Germans' powerful Panzer Division. So notably absent at this meeting, despite being very close in the vicinity, were the chiefs of both the cavalry and infantry. So the meeting participants, they were later labeled the basement conspirators, had just witnessed a stunning assault by armored forces on Leesville during the maneuvers, and they walked away convinced that the army was in dire need of reform. But they faced fierce resistance from both the inf infantry and the cavalry, two branches that favored the status quo and, expo um, and opposed the further expansion of the armored forces. So I think we all know that reform within de defense bureaucracies isn't easy. Defense bureaucracies by their nature are slow moving beasts. Um, the Louisiana maneuvers, however, they provided a way forward for those basement conspirators. They provided concrete evidence that current mechanization and equestrian practices were antiquated and in desperate need of reform. So much like the interwar debates on the future of US mechanization and horse cavalry, the United States is at a critical juncture today as it reimagines its future force. So after the US invested in a small number of exquisite manned platforms for decades, some defense analysts are starting to argue for a recon reconceptualization of the US military's posture towards one focused on mass, autonomy, survivability, or expendability. Others have characterized the change as an evolution from a hardware-centric military to a software-centric force. So a transformation from platforms to kill chains. So such a change isn't going to come easily. Um, like the interwar years, entrenched interests will favor the status quo. But simulation, whether it's in the form of war games or large scale exercises like those in Louisiana, should provide a way forward, uh, particularly for those thorny challenges that will likely require a fundamental uh, realignment of the future force. Um, so with that, I think I will hand it back over to Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. That was really interesting. Um, so uh, next up uh, on the list uh, will be myself. My, the article that I wrote uh, was called, uh, Is it a War Game? It Doesn't Matter. Um, so there are three main points that I was trying to highlight within the context of, of my article. Uh, one is that a, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, right? Um, the title of the article kind of says that, that uh, there's a, always a debate within the wargaming community about whether we should call something a war game, whether we should not call something a war game, and what is the definition of a war game. So, so I argue that that it actually doesn't matter uh, because of of two of the other the other two points that that I try to stress. One is that um, analytic rigor within the context of a war game does not necessarily translate to a good war game for what it's trying to do. And the third point is that. Uh, in order for a war game to be effective, you need actually a good ecosystem within the context of the command or the, or the war game sponsor. This could be a war game for the military or this could be a serious game. You need an ecosystem that's willing to accept and use the lessons that you're trying to learn within the context of, of that event. So, so I'm gonna start with that, that third one for a moment and say that, um, uh, what is what makes a war game valuable? Why do we do war games? Uh, why, would, why do we run war games? And and I claim um, that we run war games to influence the decision of decision makers, not trying to change their minds on something, but trying to give them additional information and make them make the people who are making decisions and the information that's being used in those decisions to to increase the breadth and the depth depending on the kind of war game. So we're trying to, to add information uh, to the decision makers in order to, to make uh, in order to make their 
decisions more robust and more informed. Um, so, so a war game, in my opinion, has value if it changes people's perceptions of the problem uh, or their ability to solve that problem. I'm not suggesting that a war game is going to solve any problem. I'm going to I'm going to fight against people who are going to say that a war game is going to solve your problem. Uh, so. It, does it change people's perceptions or does it change their ability to solve the problem through methods and means that are actually appropriate to solving that problem? If the answer is yes, if your war game influences that opinion, if, if the war game informs those decision makers, if it changes people's perceptions of the problem, then I think that yes, that war game has value. Whether the value that that war game has is a positive or a negative value is going to depend very much on whether or not it's a good or a bad war game. So I'm not saying that the quality of the war game doesn't matter. But what I am trying to say is that just because you have a good war game, if you have a bad war gaming ecosystem, then that war game isn't going to actually have value in the sense that it's not going to influence uh, decisions that are being made within the, within the sponsor of that game. So, so the ecosystem within, within that command or within that organization that's ho hosting the war game, I think is itself composed of, a, uh, of about three things. Uh, one is the, is the analytic agenda of that war game sponsor. So what are they trying to do with that war game and how does it fit within the context of everything else that they're doing? War games should not exist in isolation. Just as simulations and exercises that we just heard from Jennifer don't exist in isolation either, right? There's, there's a problem that's being tried to solve. There is a demonstration of a capability uh, within the context of an exercise. So in a war game, there's a thing that you're trying to do to influence a decision or to provide information about actions, right? So, so the analytic agenda within which the war game sits needs is an integral part of the ecosystem and an integral part of whether or not you're actually going to be able to provide value. Can that analytic agenda accept the things that a war game produces and do something with it and move that information forward? The second thing that contributes to the wargaming ecosystem on top of the analytic agenda I think is the war game culture within that organization. Does that organization know and understand what a war game is and what a war game does? War games have their limits. Exercises have their limits. Analysis has their limits. And I've seen plenty of organizations that simply think a war game is one thing, think it can do something, think it's a great panacea, think it solves all of your problems. But, but we as war game professionals, practitioners know that there is a limit to those war games, just as every analytic model has a limit. Every war game is a simulation of some kind of reality, is a model of some kind of reality with some abstraction and some level of fidelity, and it has its limits to acceptance and it has its limits to the things that it can and can't do. I don't need a war game to do everything, but I need a war game to understand itself what it can and can't do. And I need the organization that it's sitting in to understand what that war game can and can't do and not ascribe the information that it's getting from one war game to all of the other war games because every war game is different. Okay. So, so I think a war game ecosystem is composed of the analytic agenda that's being created. Uh, it's composed of the war game culture within the sponsor's organization, and it's also composed of the intellectual curiosity of the people within that or within that organization, because a war game is exploring something new. Uh, if all you're trying to do is look at and follow an immediate single chain of logic from one end to another, you're probably better off getting exploring what you're trying to do with an analytic process. You're probably better off trying to do it with something other than a war game. War games are meant to expose curiosity, to expose creativity, and to give a, a venue for lots of people to do lots of different things and to find out what might happen, to take risks in a place where you are not penalized for taking those risks and to see what might happen. So if you don't have an intellectually curious organization, then you're not going to produce interesting insights that are required uh, to, to be to fit within your wargaming culture and to be accepted by your wargaming culture and not misapplied so that way they can fit into the analytic agenda that your organization has to influence the decisions and finally create some value.
That we're giving in ecosystem uh, is necessarily a multiplier to the val to the, to the to the things that come out of a game. The wargaming ecosystem makes good games valuable, um, and actually, it kind of multiplies bad games as well. So, if you have a really bad game in uh, in an ecosystem that's willing to accept a bad game, you can amplify really bad information, and you have a potential for for doing some like real harm and some real damage. A bad ecosystem will amplify the wrong things from a war game. Uh, it will prevent good information and it will prevent good games from getting created um, and, and can do detrimental, um, uh, it can have detrimental effects, not only on the decisions that are being made, but also on other war gaming ecosystems by making the, the perception of what war games can and can't do skewed um, and, and that's a thing that, that I, I tend to see. And, and a bad ecosystem is not necessarily a malign thing. Stephen Downs Martin will talk about malign war gaming. He has an article about it. Um, but it, malign tends to, to have a, a implication of negative intent. And not all, war, not all bad war gaming ecosystems are maligned by intent. Sometimes they're maligned by ignorance. Um, there's a lot of nuances in the definition of what a war game can and can't do. And we as war gamers aren't that great at communicating those to those commands, um, partially because the people we're talking to change over every six to 12 months, maybe two years, and we barely have time to educate somebody on what it is before we move on to somebody else and we get tired of doing it, but we can't get tired of doing it because it's our responsibility to make sure that that ecosystem is fertile. So that way our good war games can be propagated uh, and, and make it easier for us to make good war games in the end. Uh, the third option is an inert ecosystem, right? You can have a good ecosystem, you can have a bad ecosystem, but you can also have a completely inert wargaming ecosystem. Um, and those are ones that, that ask for war games, they run war games and, and nothing happens. They say they had one because they think they're supposed to have one. Uh, and, and I think what we need to cultivate, um, but and, and that's both our job and the job of the sponsors is to cultivate the education that builds into a positive wargaming ecosystem. So, um, the wargaming ecosystem is uh, the need for that is one of the things that I highlighted in my article. The second thing uh, I wanted to highlight uh, was that detail and value are not synonymous. Just because you have a high level of detail and you have a high level of analytic rigor in a war game does not necessarily mean that that war game changed people's minds. A high level of detail and a high level of analytic rigor may not be required for all of the problems that you're trying to solve. And if you're trying to solve something that requires a higher level, of, a, 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 a um, more abstract level of information, then making people think that, that we need more rigor and we need more detail and we need more significant figures on the numbers that we're using, uh, it's just going to create a lot of effort that's not going to actually contribute to actual detail. That's it's not going to contribute to decisions that are going to get made. It's not going to add value. It may make the war game better in some respects, right? Because it is more rigorous, but that doesn't necessarily equate to increased value for the sponsors. I often try to, to explain things in terms of significant figures, right? For those of us that have had enough science courses when we were dealing with significant figures, um, if you have two numbers that you're trying to multiply or add, and one has 10 significant figures and the other has two significant figures, when you add them together, the result does not have 12 significant figures. It does not have 10 significant figures. It has two significant figures. It has a number of significant figures equal to the least significant thing that, or the, the least accurate thing that you're putting in. So when we're building war games, we've got to make sure that we understand what the least accurate thing that we're putting into the war game, which is often the people that are playing. So having high levels of details on numbers of pieces of units of calculations of tables uh, could be overshadowed by the fact that you have people that have not, a, not that high level of rigor or understanding of the problems or the decisions that they're making within the context of the game. And the last thing that I'll make before, the last point that I'll make before closing up uh, is, is that what we call a war game uh, is a debate that we will constantly have. You put two war gamers in a room and they will debate for hours about what is and isn't a war game and what they should and shouldn't call a war game. And does it need to be one sided? Can it be two? Does it need to be two sided? Can it be one sided? Um, is, a, is a bunch of people sitting around a table 
the it's still a war game or, or is it not a war game? Um, and, and I claim that it doesn't matter. I claim that that horse is already out of the barn, that what is a war game? People are using the term war game all of the time. And people who are not war gamers are using the term war game. So if we come back and tell people that, hey, you're using the term war game wrong, how we can't even explain to people what is and isn't a good war game. It's hard, it's going to be almost impossible to change the entire vocabulary of the entire Department of Defense overnight to, to force them to understand what the actual definition of what what a war game is, assuming that we as a war gaming community could agree upon a definition of what is a war game, which I claim that we're never actually going to be able to do. So I think that we need to be doing the thing that is useful. And if it's called a war game, or if it's called a tabletop exercise, or it's called an event, or it's called a simulation, what we need to do is help people make decisions and help people, people make good decisions with interesting and useful information that is not incorrect, that is presented at the level of fidelity that can be useful for people uh, and can increase their knowledge moving forward. And in order to actually make that happen, we need to make sure that we have a wargaming ecosystem that is receptive and understanding and can take those things and move them forward. With that, I'm going to step off my soapbox um, and I'm going to pass the mic over to Yuna Wong, um, who is going to talk about, uh, well, she's, she and I have, have had some differences of opinions on some of this stuff. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what Yuna, uh, Yuna's talk on her article. Thanks, Yuna. Thanks so, so much, Jeremy. So first of all, um, I have to talk about why I disagree with you and why you're wrong on one point. Um, then I'll sort of quickly summarize my article, but then I wanna talk about where I am in violent agreement with you about that ecosystem. So first question, does it matter what's called a war game? But this actually gets to your point, Jeremy, about there's a lot of confusion about what it does, what the limitations of the tool are, but if we're not specific about what that tool is, if anything and everything is a war game, then you can't really blame people for not understanding what it does or what it doesn't do. So I think, um, you know, many, sometimes the bright line people draw in what is a war game or not is, is, is it adjudicated? Do people have to live with the consequences of their decisions? So we talk about wargaming as a profession, and we're sort of in a very interesting space where over time we're trying to professionalize as a community, right? So we're going from a community of practice with a lot of implicit knowledge and trying to make some of that formal. Uh, we won't talk, uh, another time we'll talk about how much loss there seems to have been in wargaming skills over the last 50 years, if you sort of look at it retrospectively. But it matters in terms of methods, right? So I am a strong believer that methods matter. So if you look at all the, the publications about problem structuring methods, about uh, uh, structured analytic techniques, especially that come out of the intelligence community, about red teaming methods, um, it's we have the rest of the world has gone to a space where structured group activities have you know, have research done about them. So I recently ran a pre-mortem, which Gary Klein uh, sort of invented, wrote about in Harvard Business Review, and then there's dissertation work on whether or not it's useful for some things or others. And I think that's the space where we need to be. But again, if anything and everything is a war game, you know, again, we can't sort of fault people for saying, well, what is it? I think one thing that's useful to do is to divide up the space by what are you trying to do with the event along with the stages of problem solving. Stage one is understand the problem. Is your event to understand the problem, right? Stage, step two is to generate potential solutions. Step three is to evaluate potential solutions. And step four is to think about implementation considerations. So oftentimes if you have a war game, it might be in evaluating those uh, it, it, potential solutions to your problem. But an event can fit anywhere along that range. And for example, if you need to understand the problem, you may need, want certain types of problem structuring methods rather than um, right traditional brainstorming methods, which you might want to do in step two. But again, because there is research on these different types of methods, the more specific we can be about what it is and is trying to do, I think the, the better. Uh, so this gets to, I'll give a quick summary of my article. And so I wrote, an article that asks sort of, are we, uh, what is sort of the, are, are we making enough progress in wargaming? So many of us here 
are here because in 2015, then Secretary of Defense Bob Work uh, made a real case for reinvigorating wargaming. So several years into this, are we making progress, right? Is the quality of defense wargaming sufficient? Does wargaming actually work? Is there enough wargaming capability and capacity to meet the department's needs? And what is the state of the defense wargaming workforce, especially since many of the people who have really been um, leaders in the field are in the process of retiring right now? So we really want to talk about the quality of defense wargaming. Oftentimes, we heavily caveat our discussions about wargaming and said, well, if it's a good wargame, well, what do we mean by that? And if you look at ac across the department, are people doing things like um, unadjudicated games where, you, where basically their assumptions about how the war will go are never challenged? Do they only sort of cluster around a few expected cases? Uh, this, is, this, this is something at a departmental level. We really have to assess whether or not critical thinking and organizational learning is going on, or if it's alignment and groupthink and the carrying on of problematic assumptions, but more and more agreement and acceptance of those prob potentially problematic assumptions. Does wargaming work? Well, we talk a lot about wargaming can do this, can do that. Well, sort of, you know, the U.S. Army first encountered uh, Kriegspiels, you know, shortly after the U.S. Civil War. And we talk about what the interwar years did and what wargaming was able to do. Uh, but we don't even have good models of, of the organizational learning and what the model of organizational learning was and why it made that effective. So and I've said this uh, many times, but um, we don't want to be in a space where history became legend, legend became myth and some things uh, that should have been remembered were forgotten. Right. So, you know, we, we say uh, wargaming can help learning. Do we even measure that? Do we even look at educational outcomes? Do we even do research on, well, one class got the standard lecture, one class got the war game. Were they better able to retain things? Were they better able to evaluate things along Bloom's taxonomy of learning? Again, given the amount of um, resources the Department of Defense spends on wargaming, we should spend a little bit to assess it, right? Does it genuinely help you learn, uh, create new and more ideas or not? Uh, just a range, range of things. But one area I wanted to really violently agree with Jeremy on is he brought up the idea of an uh, ecosystem and the analytic agenda within an organization as to what they're doing. And I think you can um, talk about organizational culture and you can talk about processes. Uh, I think another way I would offer is you could structure the space by saying, a uh, given a variety of events, right? war games, tabletop exercises, studies, analyses, experimentations, as a whole for a particular defense community, you can ask first, are all those things coordinated or uncoordinated, right? And is the primary effect to build consensus or is it to test assumptions? Because I'm going to say if you have a, a situation where everything is coordinated, right? One event feeds into another, but everything is about building consensus rather than challenging assumptions, you have a situation or could have a situation where it's sort of false confidence. And I'm saying, and I would say if you have all your events are uncoordinated, so different people do things, don't necessarily learn from each other, aren't even necessarily aware of each other's activities, but they're all around sort of uh, the key organizational assumptions that people have signed off on. Uh, that's an area where you might, you know, it's marked by, I would say, incomplete group things. Right. So there is groupthink, but it's it's, you know, it, it's also in, in, in a strange way, sort of islands of groupthink. I would also say if you're coordinate, uncoordinated, right, uh, but you're testing assumptions, you have a bunch of uncoordinated activities that are testing assumptions. I would say that's sort of sporadic learning. So maybe an individual organization did a really excellent war game that challenged assumptions and really uh, got people to understand, had insights on new problems, but they don't necessarily um, learn from each other. They're not present, you know, sporadic learning. And I think the area we, we want to be in, which is really, really challenging, is coordinated activities that sort of test assumptions in maybe a systematic and coordinated way. And I think that's the point where we get organizational learning. But why it, uh, you know, it, it, but evaluating these things and where we are, are are pretty critical to trying to figure out where we are in this space. Thanks. 
Thanks very much, Yuna. Um, I appreciate uh, and, and I'm looking forward to some, some debates uh, in a moment. But first, uh, Shane Billsborough to talk about why we need to do more wargaming, uh, specifically space wargaming. Uh, thanks, Jeremy, and uh, you know, thanks for inviting me here. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the rest of the discussion. I'm, I'm sure there is going to be a fiery debate. Um, but my, uh, my my article in War on the Rocks uh, that I published a few months ago um, sort of focused on a more narrow uh, issue set. Uh, you know, it's really talking about the desirability of scaling up the space wargaming enterprise, some general challenges associated with doing that. And then it suggests some lines of research and next steps uh, that the national security space enterprise and um, the wargaming community might take to, to start that process. So, uh, so a, a, as a roadmap for you know, this 10 minute talk here, uh, I'll probably start with discussing the motivation for writing the article, um, then some general challenges associated specifically with space wargaming, um, and then those lines of research. Um, so to start, uh, it's been my conclusion for some time now, and, and I know I'm not alone in that conclusion, that the, uh, the character of future great power uh, competition and, and conflict will be defined in large part by uh, the battlefield information competition, uh, including its ISR and communications elements. Uh, so with that perspective as the backdrop, um, I also think that for the foreseeable future, uh, the information competition um, is going to have its center of gravity in the space domain. You know, hence writing this article instead of one on just the battlefield information competition and wargaming more generally. Um, in any future conflict with with China or or Russia, for that matter, almost every kill chain of operational significance, whether uh, it terminates in a sunk PLA Navy warship or a destroyed tell. Um, will depend on satellite constellations to either collect or transport targeting data from sensors to shooters, usually across vast distances and uh, most likely within minutes. Um, China naturally is, is aware of this U.S. dependency on space assets, you know, any high intensity fight, whether that's over Taiwan, the South China Sea, or some as of yet unimagined scenario and substantial uh, you know, publicly available evidence suggests that China is keenly interested in developing means of threatening US military space assets. Um, for anyone interested, uh, the Secure World Foundation releases a, a yearly report on uh, global counter space capabilities. It is a, a really good reference on where some of these blue and red investments are going and what's been observable. Um, so naturally, uh, from the U.S. perspective, uh, you know, there's been similar movement in sort of militarizing space and, and viewing it as, a, as an active domain for military competition. Um, that view is reflected in the 2020 U.S. Uh, national uh, space policy and uh, the Space Forces uh, Space Capstone publication, uh, which came uh, out of Brown late last year. Um, both clearly emphasize that the United States also views space as an environment that is rapidly becoming a warfighting domain. So, of course, uh, you know, a fair number of these statements are, are obvious to some. Um, the problem in my mind, which I address in the article, is that when you compare the level of effort, sophistication, and sheer volume of war games, um, being, of space war games being conducted today, um, compared to other eras of discontinuous change in the character of warfare. And, you know, in the article, I, I reference the canonical example of a... Uh, <clears throat> Navy wargaming during the interwar period, um, we don't appear to be in the same ballpark um, with respect to space wargaming. Um, I, you know, I, I, at the outset, you know, I readily concede that part of this perception probably stems from the fact that the you know, military space is an extremely classified and cloistered part of the defense community. It's uh, sort of by nature very reticent to engage in public intellectual discussion or debate, you know, even a very abstract ideas. Um, unlike other parts of DOD that are, you know, comfortable with having both classified and uh, sort of unclassified components of their analytical agenda, uh, analytical agendas existing in parallel um, and sometimes informing one another. Um, as a result, you know, there's almost certainly more going on behind closed doors than uh, meets the public eye. You know, Thor's hammer and Shriver being two prominent examples. Um, you know, notwithstanding th those and other closely held efforts, um, I think there remains a significant amount of unmet demand in the market for more operational and strategic war games, um, sort of exploring space war fighting and deterrence issues. Um, and the one reason I think that is simply that in the aftermath of publishing the article, a surprising number of think tank 
you know, sort of think tankers and, and policymakers reached out to me and confirmed that you know, the message needed amplification and that uh, something needed to be done to close the gap between sort of the analytical scale and importance of the space problem set amenable to wargaming and, and the current supply of space war games. Um, perhaps less encouragingly, um, and just sort of an aside, uh, you know, one other pattern I encountered in the in the aftermath of publishing this piece, piece is that a, a small minority of sort of stakeholders suggested that there might actually be a glut of space war games, um, and that analysts sort of not directly involved in you know SAP space programs should just kind of trust that everything is well in hand. Um, I disagree with that view, and, and I think the root of that view is that is that a lot of the um, sort of STEM-minded personalities that are have been involved in the nuts and bolts of space operations, acquisitions, and sustainment, um, you know, since the Cold War, really, um, are broadly under unfamiliar with what separates a war game from sort of other neighboring analytical tools um, that bear some resemblance to wargaming. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, Hackasat type events or um, the sort of high fidelity modeling and simulation environments that 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 um, lots of uh, sort of space professionals are, are used to engaging with and thinking about these problems. Um, and so as a result, there's a tendency uh, to see war games where they don't exist um, or else to failure to fail to recognize sort of their differential value um, relative to more um, formal methods. Um, from the discussion thus far, um, and just you know, knowing some of you, like it's clear that this definitional challenge is is not new to the wargaming community or or anyone on this panel. Um, but I think there's still sort of some basic educational work to be done on on popularizing the, the cycle of research, um, which one of you referenced, and and, and spreading some basic awareness, you know, if not of a formal definition of what a war game is, then sort of some basic indicators of of, of whether a thing might be a war game. Um, for, versus, you know, is clearly not a war game and is really, um, you know, analysis. But, you know, back to the specific issue of the gap, you know, that I describe in the War on the Rocks piece, um, you know, the challenges facing existing and um, prospective suppliers of war games, uh, it, you know, focused on the space domain is pretty multi-pronged. Um, uh, to start, I, I think the lack of a long and well-documented history of military space operations uh, including case studies and hard data sets, uh, is a major difficulty here. Um, the Cold War offers us a few examples of military space competition, but there are no records of space wars or historical space battles to look back on as we design space war games, you know, focused on you know, present or future you know, space operational concepts um, or, or dilemmas. You know, by contrast, um, you know, the Naval War College staff during the interwar period you know, at least they had centuries of naval history to draw on um, and data sets, you know, while designing and analyzing games, you know, exploring tactical, operational and, and strategic facets of a, a future maritime conflict with Imperial Japan. So in many ways, I would argue the, um, the task facing prospective space war gamers and in what I think will be a, a booming um, sort of analytical area over the next 20 years, um, you know, it, it is harder than that sort of faced by their 1930s brethren. Um, the other, I think, broad breed of challenge facing uh, prospective space war gamers is that while the physics of space operations is, is well understood by space professionals, um, sort of the physical laws that govern space and their implications for orbiting objects are uh, not necessarily intuitive or easy to grasp via analogy for sort of naval, air and ground war fighters um, or analysts like not steeped in, in orbital dynamics. Um, one rough example that I, I think I use in the article is uh, the example of logistics to point out that, you know, until very recently, um, when, you, when you put a satellite into space, the historical pattern has been that you do so in the expectation that it will not be replenished over the course of its operational lifespan. Yeah, you know, it has a set of fuel and once it's depleted, you know, that asset it's either deorbited or boosted into a graveyard orbit. That that doesn't really cohere with how, you know, naval, air, or ground operators um, sort of think about military operations in wartime, and and that sort of lack of coherence with um, their common experience, you know, I think coupled with another with a host of other space specific oddities, um, it can sometimes turn into, I guess, like what you might characterize as a cognitive speed bump um, for analysts that are interested in sort of expanding their scope you know, out, outside terrestrial war fighting. So, you know, having discussed the motivations for the article and, and, and some of the, uh, 
at least referring to some of the general challenges I identify. Um, I uh, talk about uh, six analytical lines of effort um, for future space war games and suggest a path forward for preceding efforts uh, in these and other areas. Um, for the sake of brevity, I'll highlight two of those six areas that I think are particularly promising for, for reasons I'll outline. Um, the first such area happens to be the last area that I introduced in the article. Um, it's focused on surfacing new operational concepts, theories of victories, and uh, red lines in the space domain. Now, I think there's an entire family of interesting analytical questions that fall into this category. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, they're in a large part focused on human decision making and perceptions rather than sort of hard technical considerations. And as such, you know, they're, they're well suited to wargaming approaches rather than uh, more formal methods um, that, that sort of space professionals might be more familiar with. Um, so to name a few of, of the questions that I think fall under um, this first umbrella, you know, what does victory mean in a space war? Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, even assuming, uh, you know, you know, the United States is well positioned to win future space battles, you know, how far should it press that advantage given other priorities? You know, on, on the one hand, uh, clearly policymakers would want to avoid, you know, Pyrrhic victories in space that endanger assets that function as, you know, critical uh, infrastructure for the civilian, you know, economy, if, if, if that's at all possible, um, you know, given like debris generation concerns, for example, um, or other risks. I mean, on the other hand, um, you know, that, that, that caution will tend against, um, you know, immediate military objectives. Um, going on, um, you know, what kind of space or earth-based activities are likely to be interpreted as you know, ambiguously hostile versus unambiguously hostile? Um, you know, how might early escalation against space as assets, you know, impact escalation dynamics on earth? I think there could be a very sort of interesting dynamic in which um, efforts to control, you know, say escalation in the maritime domain are, are hamstrung by um, incentives to escalate in space. Um, so you could have sort of a terrestrial conflict you know, driven by activities in space, which I think is a very uh, sort of unusual dynamic from, from most analysts, analysts' perspective. Um, you know, I'd add that a, a second um, secondary benefit of tackling that area early is that those questions don't really require Byzantine game designs or really expensive simulation infrastructure to explore. Um, when it comes to conceptual um, conceptual issues like these sort of less structured approaches, including seminar style games, um, I think they can be put together relatively quickly and can start building analytical momentum, you know, without long lead times or large budgetary commitments from sponsors. Um, the second area uh, worth highlighting focuses on sort of describing the geography of space in operationally relevant terms, um, whereas the, the first sort of area of, uh, of exploration I just discussed, I think is more of an analytical wargaming problem. Um, this is really more focused on sort of education and training. Um, uh, you know, as I previously mentioned, space operations take place in an environment with, you know, unique characteristics. Um, one example I, I raised in the article is that you know, the most economical path between two points in orbit um, you know, is rarely, if ever, a, a straight line, um, which means there's, there's a pervasive trade-off between energy efficient and, and energy efficiency and time to, to destination in orbit. Um, you know, th that's very counterintuitive. You know, another example is that you know, just due to basic or orbital mechanics, you know, space vehicles operating in medium Earth orbit, you know, which is between sort of 2,000 kilometers and around 35,000 kilometers above sea level um, or geostationary orbit, you know, which is uh, precisely at like 35,786 kilometers above sea level. Um, you know, you can maneuver at significantly lower fuel costs um, at those higher altitudes than you can at lower altitudes. Um, you know, these and other, you know, aspects of space operations stemming from, you know, orbital mechanics and space geography, I think are, are, are prime subjects for educational war games. Um, and, and, you know, and another set of advantages that I think are shared across both of those areas is that, um, you know, neither of these examples, uh, they, they don't demand highly detailed performance characteristics on, on either red or blue space systems to explore. Um, and such, I think they're much easier to conduct in an unclassified setting without losing 
um, significant analytical fidelity or, or risking unintentional exposure of, of classified information, which is a pervasive concern amongst um, sort of space professionals when you talk to them about sort of increasing um, space wargaming and bringing new voices into sort of strategy and policy debates associated with space. Um, so having said all that and more, like the paper concludes with a suggested path, path forward um, modeled on the uh, Wargaming Incentive Fund, uh, fund established in 2015, um, which was part of DOD's family of, of third offset strategy initiatives um, designed to in reinvigorate wargaming throughout the department, um, you know, the UNO referenced earlier. Um, it's my view that a space wargaming incentive fund modeled along those lines could send an important demand, demand signal to uh, potential space wargame suppliers. Um, you know, that space wargaming is a line of business worth getting involved in, um, you know, while encouraging the development of new breeds of wargaming visualization tools, um, supporting models and, you know, gaming techniques that integrate them, uh, you know, in new and useful ways. Um, you know, my, reg my recollection is that the original uh, Wargaming Incentive Fund, you know, was a relatively light budgetary lift at, you know, $10 million per year. You know, and I think that when you think about, you know, that price tag, you know, in comparison to the gravity of some of the issues um, that need to be explored in space wargaming and their, their potential impact on the future, the sort of the character of future, the future of warfare, um, see, it would seem like a good expenditure of resources. So uh, with that, I'll hand the uh, mic back to you, Jeremy. Thanks very much. So uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to kind of, uh, I've been noting some questions myself, so I'd like to kind of pepper a couple of questions uh, around all of us, but um, let's get the discussion started among, among the four of us here. Uh, and then once we uh, run out of interesting things to ask each other, uh, we'll start bringing in some of the questions from the Discord. Uh, so let me start with, with Jennifer. Um, so the We've been talking, uh, so you and I have been talking about kind of the the acceptance of war games and whether or not you can do something with the information, right? And and Shane is advocating for doing this with space and bringing it in, uh, but we run into this problem of like getting commands or getting organizations to accept the outcomes of a of a war game to do something. Looking at it from a from an exercise and a simulation perspective, do you see similar hurdles or or the problems just that much bigger? when it comes to the Louisiana exercise, the Louisiana maneuvers, right? Uh, it, it seems like it seems like the momentum is greater when it comes to exercises, but that just might be me looking uh, at the grasses greener on the other side of a fence. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think I think the same problems persist within the modeling and sim community. And I mean, there's great anecdotes from the Louisiana maneuvers where it was the same thing. I mean, when you were talking about having a broader ecosystem around a war game to make sure that it's successful, I mean, it was the same thing within the Louisiana maneuvers. If Marshall didn't have buy-in from Roosevelt, he wouldn't have been able to do a lot of the things that he was able to do. Um, there was still a lot of debate in the Louisiana maneuvers on the role of anti-tank guns, um, even based on what was occurring. I mean, there was still a lot of debate around the role of horse cavalry. I mean, even though, I mean, at one point, there's this crazy example where a National Guard unit had to abandon their horses in the field because they were so dehydrated. Um, people still didn't want to give up on tanks. So I think, you know, even when you've got these very concrete examples, there will always be groups of people that don't want to buy into it. So I don't think, you know, wargaming is a panacea. I don't think modeling and simulation is a panacea. I don't think experiments are a panacea. I think they become these really useful data points in a broader discussion. And you need that ecosystem to kind of bring those data points forward. And part of the reason why, like, I love Peter Perla's cycle of research ideas. In my mind, you know, if you can take these data points and bring them together across multiple events, you have this much, like, you can have a much richer conversation about various insights that you might have pulled out and what that actually means. Yeah, thanks very much. That, that's interesting. Um, the fact that the, the cycle of research, uh, which we, we purport in wargaming all the time, really is is important to all of the pieces of analysis that we need to do whenever we're trying to, to do some analytics, right? We need to make sure that we bring it all in together. 
Uh, so the the kind of analytics that we that we don't tend to do, Yuni, that you talked about, is is the efficacy of of actual war games. So the question that I had when I was reading your article and brought up again when you were when you were talking mm -hmm. was. Um, when you're talking about whether or not we've studied well that we've studied whether or not war games do what we say and we think that they can do right this mythology that war games are this important um, method for for changing people's minds and, and player experience and player learning uh, but but i would offer that a lot of that work has been done in an educational sphere right so there's been work about interactive things about moving away from lectures um there, the simulations and gaming journal often has articles about new kind of gaming methods right so so what makes um either you skeptical of that research or what makes the dod population a different enough population that we have to do all of these studies over again so i think some of this is uh some previous discussions with someone i um had known who was leading the education research at RAND. And I was saying, you know, so she was like, well, do you have classroom protocols to know during war games that learning is going on? I'm like, no. And um, she was just very surprised. So even though maybe some of these things have been done with some populations, there's always the question of generalizability to the population that you are actually studying, right? For professional military education. Also, um, I, but you know, she but she was saying everyone wants to teach 21st century skills, but no one knows how to do it. And I'm like, if you could take graduate students and say you were displaying these, uh, would that be generalizable to maybe the, this population she was studying? And she said yes. And but she's like, but we don't know how persistent the effect is either. So um, I mean, in some, it, it appears that in some areas, yes. But like we just keep re we, like we as war gamers and people who make our business off of this, right? We are in our livelihood and sometimes too much of our identity. Like it's like we go to church. It's like oh, war games are great, and it's like the the chorus of believers, right? You go to church and you uh, repeat the tenets of the faith, and war gaming will do this, and war gaming will be make you a creative thinker, and war gaming, and well, well, does it, right? We can say it does, but at some point we should be evidence-based and we totally have the methods and the ability to do this. So I was talking to someone who is perhaps thinking about doing his dissertation on this maybe, but right, like we have, we have the ability to go to the war colleges or another uh, professional military education setting and say, okay, what is the theory for what is cognitively and in the learning space? And we're just talking about individual level learning we're not even talking about group level learning. We're not talking about social cognition and the sort of informal theories we have about social cognition and organizational learning and the relate, right? What are the variables? What's the theory? What's the theoretical, uh, what's the theory? What's the uh, co construct of interest? How do you operationalize that construct of interest to measure it, right? Let's say you have a board game of the cities, of the, the you know, Peloponnesian War versus a lecture, okay? Well, does one group, does the intervention group test better on those sort of educational outcomes? Do they retain it better? Are they showing higher order skills? So we can even go back to um, Fun Mulkey the Younger, right? Who made it a requirement that in order to apply, I think it was to the a command and staff college, that a candidate had to have a letter of recommendation from his commander assessing how well he had done as the adjudicator for a unit level war game. So, right, you look at Bloom's taxonomy of learning, and that's sort of the highest level in the pyramid of Bloom's taxonomy where you are evaluating. So the person was had to be evaluated on how they were doing at the highest levels of Bloom's taxonomy. But that's an in, that's like an informal theory. We haven't tested it. Right. So do the war games help you maybe at different levels? Right. Do they help you? Are they better at evaluating things like the Peloponnesian War in an ex another context? Right. Can they generalize outside of that context? Does it help you maybe retain facts, but does it not help you on the higher um, analytic levels of Bloom's tax or more critical thinking? We don't know. We just throw these terms around as if entire disciplines don't study them and spend their entire careers on them. And as a social scientist, like I, you know, like this is like, that's great. You guys are talking about psychology. We're the psychologists. Okay. Like I don't go around making pronouncements about physics. 
and expecting to be taken seriously, right? Because no one should take me seriously. It is, I did suck at electricity and magnetism, by the way. I sucked at it. I admit it. That is, you know, one of the reasons, right? I'm not in that field. But I, I think the intellectual rigor in assessing and using these terms about learning, about the cognition, about what we're doing, because it all exists, we should apply it and not remain sort of, right, like, it's 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 like um, anti-intellectual about what it is that we're doing because we can study this. Yeah, I think you know you re raised some awesome points, and um, the modeling and sim community when it comes to training is grappling with very similar issues. So when we think about training from a readiness standpoint, we're oftentimes thinking about these input-based metrics. So the amount of times, a per, you know, the amount of hours a person's flying a plane versus the amount of sorties they can get on a target. And so we're starting to think about how do you develop metrics that can actually assess whether someone is actually learning from that training in a much more compelling way. And it's caused us to reevaluate who needs to be part of that training ecosystem. So first is what, what do those metrics need to look like? And then who needs to be part of that? So people that specialize within the science of learning are now helping you know, modeling and sim providers that develop these simulators or simulations um, so that when um, in real time they can assess, say, a uh, pilot's maneuver. And what we're starting to try to really grapple is, with is like, what? It, how do you assess things like collective training? Is it based on communication? What does that look like? And while I don't wanna say there's a one-to-one -one comparison with wargaming, because these are obviously different things, I do think there are things we can start to learn from that. So for instance, when we think about designing a war game, who else needs to be part of that conversation? Do we need to, besides having war game designers with analysts working with a sponsor, do we also need to have four experiential games, people that specialize in the science of learning, helping within that game design, and how do we change that? And then you get into these really uh, tricky problems, which is actually something that my company is grappling with right now, is when you have things like operational decision support tools, which are fundamentally analytic tools. So you're trying to measure better decision-making processes. Well, what does better decision-making looking look like? I mean, that's a fundamentally fuzzy thing. Um, so when we start to think about wargaming and analytic wargaming, you know, it, building efficacy metrics around that becomes fundamentally very, very challenging. And I'm not saying I've got a good answer in, on this, and I'm not saying there's good lessons to be drawn from the uh, modeling sim community on this yet, because I don't, I, it is a challenge we're working on, but I think it's something that the wargaming community and the modeling and sim community should together be having a broader conversation around because it's, we're, we're both struggling with the same thing. And ideally we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel, we should be learning from each other. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in and just violently agree with Jennifer. So I think I think our solution um, is to kidnap some experimental psychologists and just impress them into wargaming. Because when you talk to them, they just are um, they just lose their minds if you get them talking about the efficacy of training. They're like they don't test, they don't assess, they don't ask, right? They don't give feedback afterwards. They just have a survey at the end of the course. Like they can talk for two hours really passionately about how the assessment is not being done. And I'm, well, I have some new, I have some bad news for you, right? It's even worse in the wargaming community, right? Where there isn't even the sense that we should be measuring this. But again, for years, I have been saying this, we just need to like find some psychologists, but the right ones, right? Not like, not like random ones, uh, but the ones who have the theory and research methods and tools to study this sort of thing and just create Stockholm syndrome and make them think that they're wargamers so they'll stick around. No, that's that's fantastic. Uh, th thank you both. Um, Shane, let me bring you into the conversation uh, with with a, a choice. I'm going to ask you to pick pick a koa, um, uh, and then I have a follow up question. Uh, one, which is more important to do first uh, to include space in other to include more accurate space in other war games? or to do war games about space operations? And then corollary, uh, what about space exercises? What does that look like? Right, um, <clears throat> that's a great question. And I've, I've wrestled with myself over that. Um, I mean, the cop out answer is that we should be moving out on both, you know, obviously both prongs at the same time because they'll be mutually reinforced. Um, I think, uh, Hold on, I'm getting a bunch of 
messages that's cropped in my screen here. Uh, so let's see. Um, I, I think it's probably um, most important to start integrating space into joint war games um, so, sooner rather than later. Um, the reason is the department correctly is moving out very quickly on developing joint operational concepts um, that, you know, a, as I referenced at, at sort of the beginning of my talk today, um, you know, space is really at the center of them, whether or not sort of the uh, the Navy, air, and, and land analysts that are sort of working on them, or, or war fighters that are working on them, are, are, are aware of that or not. Um, so, you know, it's sort of in triaging the vast number of problems here. I, I think getting higher fidelity space wargaming into those joint operational concept development discussions is, is really vital, or we're going to move out quickly and decisively on concepts that haven't really been stress tested in their most important areas. And, you know, and, I, and I maintain that's in the battle network competition and specifically in the space component of the battle network competition. Um, so that, that, that I think is my short answer to the sort of bifurcation you offered. But I, I would maintain there's enough, I think money and bandwidth in the wargaming community and sort of the broader DOD analytical community um, that we should be moving aggressively on both fronts. Um, what was your follow-up? Uh, space exercises, uh, any opportunities or, or what, is, what might that look like? Uh, it, it probably looked pretty sapped, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I think um, aside from that, I, I think there's more potential for them than there was historically. Um, because launch costs are decreasing so rapidly, um, because a lot of sort of the, the more modern and, and sort of future space systems you know, aren't these sort of billion dollar programs there, you know, more disposable platforms, you know, that are much smaller, so, you know, the micro and nanosats. Uh, I think there's a lot more potential to do space exercises sort of earlier. If there's going to be a space cycle of research, you know, earlier in that development, uh, as opposed to, um, to later, because the costs of doing so are lower. Um, and, and because, I mean, historically a problem with doing space exercises would be, you know, what I mentioned, like you put satellites up there, um, with a limited amount of fuel, you know, you know, working through say like a defensive maneuver plan for a constellation, like you, you can't only recently have, you know, like, like Vivisat, for example, is a commercial space company that, you know, basically sends up a gas tank to dock up with a satellite and, and refill its fuel. Um, historically, if, if you practice defensive maneuvers, well, you just expended, you, you just drastically diminished the, the service life of that constellation. Um, with sort of on-orbit servicing and refueling capabilities, you know, coming online and then, you know, presently in the next few years, um, I, I think the, the cost benefit of conducting more space exercises, even for signaling purposes, to demonstrate to competitors that we have these capabilities, um, you know, obviously, they're going to be conceal reveal decisions in, in involved in that, but I think it, it opens new opportunities, both from a deterrence and warfighting perspective. So, yes, generally, I'm more bullish on that than it would have been 10 years ago. Go so, ahead, I, think, I think there are some interesting lessons as well. Sorry, I don't mean to keep just drawing lessons from left, left and right, but from the cyber community when it comes to um, exercises, particularly the use of synthetic environments. So similar problem, you're not going to want to integrate in live cy cyber fire into an exercise. There's also so many issues integrating in live uh, integrating in live cyber, like you were talking about, Shane, when it comes to revealing capabilities, revealing vulnerabilities. Um, or just the potential for something to go wrong, for an exercise to be sabotaged, cascading effects. Like, I mean, across the board, it can be highly problematic. But what we have started to realize within the synthetic training community is you can integrate in the effects of a cyber operation by just simu by simulating cyber. So, for instance, what they're starting what they're starting to do is integrate cyber ranges in with kinetic mission training or programs, where you're just integrating the effect of the cyber operation into that kinetic mission training program. So it seems to me you could create some kind of simulated, and I'm not a space expert, so Shane, feel free to rip this apart. You could create a simulated environment based on what actually matters from a space from the space domain for an operation, and you could integrate that into a kinetic mission training program. And you're focusing on simulating the effects, which actually brings the classification level down. So you can move things, at least in cyber, we can move things away from the TSSEI level down to the secret level by just looking at effects. So, yeah, I think that's a that's a great point, and I, I think it sort of gets back to sort of building a, a, a space focused cycle of research that integrates sort of a lot of the tools we're discussing. Um, I, I think you know, it's 
from my perspective, use of a high fidelity um, modeling and simulation environment in this context, it can sort of help you filter the issues, let's say the tactics or concepts that you, the highest priority ones to actually expend the resources on exploring in reality. Um, you know, so, so it's kind of a, the middle step, right? You know, you might war game the, uh, the abstract idea, then you might sort of in a, in a more physics-based environment, you know, the, the, you'd be more familiar with Jennifer, um, you know, sort of filter out, you know, some of those ideas and say like, okay, which of those were sort of just assumptions made in the room, which can be borne out, you know, sort of in a more empirical manner. And then sort of, you might take the best of breed and test those on orbit. Um, you know, the, the other thing I'd, I'd add though, is that, uh, you know, I, I'm sort of, of drawing a nuclear analogy in my mind. Like I, I think there is real value in, in doing some of these exercises in the real world, even if the modeling and simulation environment was so high quality and so um, so high, uh, you know, we had such high confidence in it that we felt we didn't need to. Um, because again, for sort of those deterrence and war fighting uh, reasons, um, being able to physically demonstrate that you can accomplish something and, and, and telegraph that to a potential adversary um, it, you know, is, is a tool that we shouldn't, you know, take too lightly. And, and that's sort of like part of the debate on nuclear testing, right? That's sort of the analogy I'm drawing. Like we can, we have, you know, very capable, uh, modeling capabilities to say like, you know, this weapon will fire and have precisely these effects over this area. Um, but from a deterrence perspective, you know, d does that, that doesn't get you much in terms of, re you know, driving the point home that, you know, despite 50 years of never having used such a device, um, you know, we still maintain the capability to do so. Um, so that's just sort of the, the, the analogy that's coming to mind. Thanks. Uh, so I think we've all talked a little bit about the, the wargaming ecosystem idea. And, and I think that's one of the things that we all tend to agree on. So I'm gonna throw out uh, an idea uh, and, and see if you agree or disagree. Um, so how having a good wargaming ecosystem is a good thing. Um, but how do we know what a good wargaming ecosystem is? So I'm going to propose that uh, if you ask a sponsor what the purpose of a war game or an exercise or a piece of analysis is, if you ask the organization, the sponsor of that thing, um, what the war game is, and they can't answer it in a simple and straightforward forward manner, then you have a bad ecosystem. If you ask the designer of the war game what the purpose of that thing is within the context of the sponsor and they can't answer it, you probably have a bad war game. Um, agree, disagree? Um, agree, and I, ha I will say that as previously having been the hapless government action officer who was assigned to be the action officer for a war game, that I didn't even know what was a war game. I didn't even know what, why we fit it in. I was just told to do it. And then I encountered Peter and Peter thought realized that I thought a war game was the same as a survey. And so he yelled at me. And then Ed McGrady was trying to soften it, right? Because I was the sponsor, government sponsor. But that's when I realized like how sensitive some people could be about um, the how, what is and is not a war game. So my coworkers tried to soften and go, oh, he's just trying to prove that he's the expert, I'm like, no, no, there's something going on. I've basically insulted the man and his entire like life, you know, life's purpose, right? So that, you know, that's part of my conversion to, well, anything and everything is a war game and it doesn't matter to, oh, there could be something more at stake in it. But I agree with you, right? Because I was obviously a symptom of a bad ecosystem where I didn't know what the purpose was. I didn't know what was gonna fit into the larger sort of sequence of things that uh, we had. But I had the ability to sign the check, so obviously something was wrong. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with you too, Shane. Uh, I mean, sorry, Jeremy. So um, I, I just did an interview with a bunch of, I did a series of interviews with a bunch of Wargame sponsors. And I, I would say that if the designer and the sponsor don't know what the purpose of the Wargame is and what they're doing, then yes, it's a bad ecosystem. But if the designer knows what they're doing, I think it's up to them to kind of coach the sponsor. And if the sponsor is willing to be engaged, I think you can create a good ecosystem. So some of the best work, some some of the best interviews I had with Wargame sponsors was when they talked about how they had this iterative, multi-pronged engagement with the designer, 
where they had multiple conversations up front about what were the questions they wanted to answer, what the designer could actually achieve, what the game was going to achieve. And then as they were going through, they would have even more conversations to include like after play testing the game. So I think, you know, if a designer is a good designer, like, you know, they should be able to guide the sponsor and they should, and obviously you need the sponsor to want to be engaged or at least their team to be engaged. But you could create, I think you could create that ecosystem provided they're keen, even if maybe they're, you know, a newbie up front. Do, do you have any uh, publication on that uh, yet? Or is that coming out? That sounds really interesting. Um, it's an internal publication, but we will definitely see about spinning, spinning some of that off. Yeah, we did like, it was actually a pretty cool um, project. We did um, several dozen interviews and then we ran a giant survey. We got like 700 respondents. So I'll definitely see if there's something we can spin off from it that yeah. might be uh fun. Totally understanding that, uh, you know, sensitivities with, with those kind of interviews and getting frank conversations out. But I'm confident that the community here would be would be really interested uh, if it's at all possible. Thanks. Shane, uh, any thoughts yeah. from you? Sure. Um, once again, I, I'm tempted to split the difference here. So the way you, you frame the question, you know, there's sort of an ecosystem sort of lack of knowledge on, you know, this, the definition of a war game and, and what separates the two. And there's sort of an individual sort of game design team or, you know, sort of sponsor, um, you know, sponsor designer pairing on the other side. Um, I think, I, I mean, my instincts are kind of consequentialist on this question. So I think you can get useful insights out of bad games. You can stumble upon them. It's less probable. Um, and, and probably in circumstances like that, you really want a game series to ensure that sort of the bad characteristics of the one game um, sort of don't taint your analysis writ large. Um, that you know, one of the utilities of having a series approach to games is that you know, you're not vulnerable to the, um, you know, the, the the eccentricities of whatever went into designing one game in that series. You can improve over time. Um, so I think on the individual game side, I'm, I'm, I'm much more willing to be sort of the consequentialist and say it's a useful to have, but it, it, it's not an absolute necessity. Um, I think when you get to sort of the, the systemic question um, of whether there's sort of a, a general understanding of at least like the, the minimums, the fundamental characteristics of a war game, or at least the common characteristics of it, when, when that starts to reach a, sort of a critically low level, th then I think there's, there's, there's really potential for um, war gaming to turn into a perfect double-edged sword. Um, and it's very difficult to predict whether it will add or detract value from the intellectual environment. I mean, I think as, as multiple, um, but both you, Yuna, and, and, and Jeremy, and I think possibly Jennifer as well mentioned, you know, wargaming is powerful. Um, it creates, um, you know, synthetic environments that can be very convincing. And if it's doing that at a systemic level, you know, in a way that's sort of not self-conscious of what its limitations are and, and what separates it from other forms of, of sort of analytical exploration, um, I, I totally think it can accelerate the department um, along um, sort of bad apps. Um, and it's just as likely to do that as it is to win out bad ideas or, or, or high ones. Um, so yeah, uh, at, at the ecosystem level, in summary, um, I think it's much more important than at the individual game level. Thanks. Uh, so for, for other folks within the panel, um, any questions or discussions that you want to have before we jump to the Discord questions? Seeing nothing from uh, anyone there. All right. Um, so let's try to jump at some of the questions that have been showing up in the Discord. Um, first one there on the screen, Jennifer, if field exercises weed out PowerPoint warriors, uh, if we can war game, can we incorporate fatigue friction? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so at least in the Louisiana maneuvers, it wasn't fatigue although friction certainly fed into it that allowed them to figure out who were the future leaders. It was their creativity, their agility, their willingness to break the mold. And I definitely think war games can surface creative insights and surface those kind of responses. Um, I don't necessarily know if like fatigue I mean, I mean, maybe people on this panel will disagree with me, but like, I don't, I don't necessarily know if that's necessary. I think, you know, whenever you construct a war game, just like whenever you construct an exercise or training and end goal, like a training event, you always have to focus on well, what is that training end goal, 
And I don't necessarily know if, say, fatigue and certain types of friction don't always contribute to that training end goal. So I think it's you know critical to think about you know, what are the things that we really need to surface? And you, you could theoretically, you know, design war games that can surface the kind of qualities that you want in your, your future leaders, theoretically. Yeah, I'll, I'll follow up on that and, and agree with you. Um, when we look at fatigue and friction, it really depends on whether or not that that's relevant to the, the outcome of the war game, right? So, um, I, I think some of the question, right, if, is if field exercises are weeding out the people that are just sitting behind the desk and, and sitting at computers doing nothing, right? What is it that war games can can weed out? Can we can we use war games to weed out um, people that are bad at making decisions? Perhaps um, can we use that as a as a training metric for for future leaders? Question to the panel. I mean, clearly, Fon Mulkey the Younger did, right? He used it as a screening tool to even let people into a school, right? So they had to be performing certain types of evaluative cognitive tasks about at least things at the tactical level and be able to have it at a certain level of fluency to actually run a unit level game before he would even consider them. Is that a thing that anybody here thinks that we can do today? I think it's good. I think it's a challenge. Um, I, I, I think there's not enough trust in war games from a leadership and an organizational perspective to be able to say that we're going to use these as a training or an educational or, or a weed out tool. Um, other thoughts? I, I yeah, I, I'm also uh, skeptical on that, Jeremy. Uh, if only because, I, obviously, times have changed since Von Mulkey, but I, I think we are in an era of discontinuous change um, in the nature of warfare right now, which means we're in an era of discontinuous change in the nature of military decision making. Um, it, we don't yet know sort of how sort of AI ML decision aid tools, for example, are, are going to interact with military decision makers and what kind of cognitive characteristics in those human decision makers um, are going to prove most efficacious in combination with those sorts of, you know, those sorts of tools. Um, it, it may be that, you know, sort of the future warfighting environment will select for different characteristics, sort of cognitive characteristics than um, sort of our historical experience, you know, would suggest would be likely, right? Um, you know, it, it may be that, in fact, it may be that our historical experience will actually be a detriment here um, if those characteristics change radically in the next 20 years, which, which I think they're poised to do. You know, again, I'll, I'll hit on the information, the role of information in warfare point again. Um, I think that is going to become uh, much more critical than it ever has before. Um, so we, we don't really have a clear idea yet on sort of how that change in the nature of warfare is going to select for different kinds of military decision makers. Um, so so I, I would be reticent to drive too far on selecting who's a PowerPoint warrior and who's not um, until we're much more mature in our understanding of that new environment. Sorry, I, I want to jump in and say I do agree that there's a disconnect between individual level screening and things that are unit level performance. So that there's group, it's group based performance that you care about. And even now, this is reflected in the criticism of the modern day performance review that gives. Um, right, too, too infrequent feedback on individual performance rather than information that a group needs to have to perform. And especially, I agree with Shane about changes, right? So even living in an information-based economy, supervisors actually are less expert than the people they supervise in many of those knowledge-based tasks and couldn't actually provide individual level criticism of the tasks that they're doing. So upward discrimination and expertise is a problem with management. So uh, for, for various reasons, individual level screening for those uh, group-based outcomes in this type of uh, information intense tasks is probably inappropriate. Thanks. Uh, so next question from Discord, please. Is it possible for games to drive reform as well as those exercises did? I'm gonna leave that one out in the in the panel for a moment while I think about it. I'm gonna suggest that uh, games can drive reform. Um, 
However, I'm not even sure that we've seen a historical example of it at, at that level, right? Um, we've seen like the, the Naval War College, right? Clearly the best example of, 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 of war gaming. And I think the, the grasp, I uh, was browsing the, the discord uh, during some of the, some of the pauses. Uh, and, and I think people were stating that, that the grasp between the Naval War College ac uh, and War Plan Orange and all of that, and the, and the interaction between that and the actual things that have taken place, uh, other than a couple of claims about, about yes, they were impactful, there isn't the, the data that, that Yuna was talking, that, that you was talking about missing to say that there was a legitimate connection between those two. Um, I do think that people walk out of war games and then go do things, right? Um, do they do it at a, at a high level? If you have a high enough level war game, I would bet that there's some folks in the White House or the National Security Council that have gone and made choices and decisions based on war games. Um, we probably will never know about those things. Um, but I'm not necessarily a historian, so I'm going to say that that it's probably yes. Um, and whether that's a good thing or not is probably up for debate. I would like to propose a possible alternative causal me uh, causal route. So sometimes we say war games drive innovation, but maybe it's organizations that are innovative war game, right? And not the other way around. So it's maybe the ecosystem as Jeremy is talking about of the particular organization or community that frees up resources to question things. Um, and I've had this discussion with Phil Purnell before, is if you were forbidden to war game, wouldn't innovative organizations still find a way to innovate? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, war, war gaming helps helps people do it in a constructive and organized fashion, but that, that shouldn't stop people from coming up with good ideas. Uh, it just may change the, the methods that they use to, to explore. I almost said test, that would be a bad thing. Um, of, to explore those ideas uh, and move them to their logical conclusions uh, or potential many conclusions and see what happens. All right. Uh, uh, so much of our wargaming history is taken up by discussion of the Naval War College's games. Why do you think there's so little discussion about the Army wargaming simulations ahead, um, ahead of or during World War II? Uh, I'll, I'll throw down the I am not a historian card uh, and, and really bad at following all of these. So I'm hoping some other folks on the panel um, know more details about the Army War Gaming. I think this is a good question for Matt Caffrey, right, who has been collecting information on this. Uh, but perhaps the persistence of the, uh, Naval War College um, as a wargaming organization has something to do with it. Um, so there's always that. Uh... Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm going to say something and then almost certainly regret it. Um, I think the uh, because, because I'm not a historian, but just knowing sort of about the, the cultural proclivities of those different services historically, um, you know, I recall that you know, the army historically has been sort of accustomed to growing and shrinking over time um, and, and not having a lot of sort of you know, being, being comfortable with changing um, as, as sort of political and, and social circumstances um, evolve, whereas the uh, you know the Navy, you know it, it's its service culture at least you know as, as scholars at Rand have written. I think there was a, a a book once called The Masks of War, um, which was kind of famous. I, I think I'm recalling that from grad school at some point. You know, it, its service culture is, is is way more fixed on continuity and both intellectual continuity and sort of continuity of the way it operates, you know, in the strategic environment, um, which is more conducive to, um, you know, sort of an established um, sort of war gaming, you know, organization and, you know, established relationship between war games and plans and programmatics, um, you know, than the army, you know, historically an institution that's, required to take budgetary hits, grow large, get small, change its problem set far more often than the Navy has historically. Um, so it might be harder for them to maintain that kind of analytical capability and focus. Um, so I'm sort of back projecting there and saying that may have been an issue at the time as well. 
Yeah, I, I just want to say I'm not I'm not entirely sure. I'm not a historian either. But what's surprised me, and this is more of a critique, I guess, of political science, is when we talk about the innovation literature, we tend to use the same historic cases over and over again. And I think there's lots of interesting cases that we haven't actually properly dived into and looked for you know, useful insights, realizing that, you know, historical comparisons can only go so far, but there's a lot to draw. And it really surprised me when I first started looking into Louisiana maneuvers that nothing was really written. I was really worried I wouldn't find anything. It wasn't until July of this year that a book came out on it. So, and I mean, I've seen this over and over and over again. So I do think there's, you know, a lot of rich, interesting examples out there that are just like waiting for us to, you know, surface. Um, and I think that's that's part of the problem. We need to stop reinventing the wheel. Yeah, no, and, and Jennifer, I think I think that really is important. Um, you know, what Yuna mentioned before kind of got under my skin and 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 because it's something that I'd thought about, that it's uh, you know, the, the idea that I mean if we keep referring to the same historical cases in every article, in every book, and say like, you know, look at these geniuses at the Naval War College in the 1930s, look what they accomplished. You know, ultimately they saved the world and defeated Imperial Japan. Um, you repeat that narrative enough and you, it stops being a historical case study, historical case study, and it starts sort of being an emotional touchstone. Um, and, and that's a dangerous place to be sort of epistemically. Um, so I think having a broader range of case studies to refer to, um, can sort of shift our dependence from that one narrative and, and possibly free us up professionally to look at it more quickly and more skeptically. Um, sort of, again, that sort of goes back to your comment, Jeremy, on saying that like, well, yeah, but when you really dig down, um, you know, the, the evidence is thin in terms of the causal relationships between sort of wartime performance and, you know, the, the ostensibly, you know, the, the greatness of that wargaming program that we always refer back to. I would offer a, as a counterpoint to the Naval War College example, um, we know that the Marines in Quantico for at least 10 years appear to have continuously wargamed using, I think the game was a land forces game, but no trace of it exists. Can't dig up any um, references. Um, uh, I I'd previously like sent Sebastian down to Marine Corps University to try to find archival information, right? Like he, and he did it for free because like once a Marine, like you just can like task them with things and they think they have to like do things for you. But um we, all of that vanished. It doesn't mean that th there was no learning. It doesn't mean it wasn't couldn't have been valuable, especially if they iterated continuously for ten years. But we have no written record. Yeah, and and, and I think all of this discussion ties into the question that we have right now, which is uh, on the screen right now, which is uh, what are the examples of best practices for creating that positive ecosystem for wargaming? And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start by by talking about some of the the reasons I started writing that in the article ab about the ecosystem. Uh, and, and that's because we've spent so much time fighting with sponsors, trying to get them to understand what war games are. And it actually took us quite a while uh, uh, at CNA to, to really understand what the problem was, right? We didn't know why they weren't getting it. It was obvious to us that war games do this and they war games do this and they don't do that. So stop trying to do that. But war games, or, but sponsors kept trying to push us in directions that we were uncomfortable with, and we didn't understand why. Um, and and finally, what I don't have a best practice. I have a what we do now, and that what we do now will probably change. But what we do now um, is is ask people three questions that I put in the article. Right. The first one is what are you trying to do with your war game, with this war game? Not what are you trying to get out of your war game, but what are you trying to do with your war game? How does it fit into that analytic agenda, right? And, and without asking them their analytic agenda that they might not wanna share with you, you can at least ask how does this war game fit into a bigger picture? Um, and I expect for most of our sponsors, that's the first time that they've thought of that question when I ask, that, when I ask it to them. Um, and, and that's that starts the process to building it, forcing people to think that this is not a one-off event. And then the second question we ask is, what are your ob what are the objectives for this war game itself? Uh, so what are you trying to do at the end of it? And and the purpose of that question is, we all need objectives for a war game, or we can't design it. 
but it also separates in the sponsor's mind the difference between what are you trying to do with a war game and what are you trying to get out of a war game. And those are two fundamentally different things. There's the physical things that you have in your hand, and there's the things that you do with those things that you have in the hand. There's the next step and there's the now step. Uh, and if you want a good war game, you need to understand how the now step fits into the next step. Uh, and then there's the, the constraints and restraints and making sure that's the, the third thing that we'll ask the, uh, the sponsors is, is just making sure that they understand that you are constrained in your design by a lot of the things that they're going to impose on you and, and get that connection. So we've found that that asking so those three simple questions um what is the outcome what is your intended outcome what are your objectives and what are your constraints and restraints uh really gets war game sponsors into the right headspace um and that has worked for us on a limited number of occasions it uh, when people will engage with with those questions um so that's the best advice that i've got panel I would say that there are some people in the community playing the long game, right? Teaching students at um, civilian and military institutions about what wargaming is early on. So years later, when they become the action officers and the sponsors, they're not sort of completely new to it. But there is a, you know, some there's a dual demand for wargaming skills. One is to become wargamers, but the other one that people oftentimes teach to is just to become better consumers of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that, that's definitely vital. Um, the, the earlier you introduce, say, a military professional to wargaming, the more naturally it'll be part of their intellectual DNA. Um, I guess on the supply side of this, I think there's also an answer, which sounds kind of trite, um, but it, it's that I think wargame suppliers or prospective suppliers of wargames need to get more comfortable with saying no. Um, and, and by that, I mean, you know, th there's lots of prospective, you know, quote unquote, sort of like wargame sponsors. They want to have a war game, you know, if only because, you know, it, it's become much more of a buzzword, which is both a positive and a negative. Um, you know, creating a positive ecosystem for war games is, is, is going to, it's, it's going to involve doing something very hard, uh, which is sometimes turning down money when a war game isn't the, uh, you know, when, when a problem set isn't mature enough yet to war game. You know, you know, sometimes you have to accept that we want to get this question there, but it's not gameable right now. Um, and I think a lot of the problems with the wargaming ecosystem, um, not all of them, but a fair number, you know, come from the supply side. It's that, you know, providers saying that if you've got an operational problem, I can game it. Um, you know, don't, don't worry about, we'll figure out how to game it. Um, but there are a lot of questions that just aren't mature enough yet. Um, and, and so you end up with situations in which, you know, war games are, are sort of blasting out, you know, quote unquote insights, um, you know, that aren't really backed up by, by a lot of sort of underlying data and information. Um, and and that sort of goes back to my comment about war games being a double-edged sword. Like practitioners of war games need to be, you know, you know, I think sort of self-effacing enough to understand that maybe they're not relevant yet to a problem. That, you know, maybe, maybe a year or two down the line they will be, but, you know, not necessarily in, you know, the first, you know, the first wave of attacks on a given issue. So in a sense, it might be a sense of like analytic patience. Yeah, I guess to add on to this, um, I think, you know, beyond the sponsor piece, there's in kind of dovetailing off what you're saying, um, Sean, it's the analytic piece. So it seems to me that it's very ma difficult to manage data capture management and analysis through a single game, let alone across multiple games and making sure that those insights are being surfaced. Um, across games and through experiments and training events. And I know Bob Work put a lot of effort into this with like the DWAG and the DOD Wargaming Repository. And I know a lot of those efforts have failed to bear the kind of fruit that a lot of people were hoping they would yield. So I think, you know, there's a broader question on like, and I guess maybe I'm gonna poke some, make some people upset here, but, I think when we think about the wargaming ecosystem writ large, it's who are the other communities that we need to be working with where these, there's these pain points in the wargaming community and there's pain points across the cycle of research where other communities could theoretically be helping to solve these problems. So whether, especially when we start to think about these 
you know, technology problems that maybe war games ha have a harder time addressing. So, you know, are there people within the MS community that might be able to help when it comes to the analytic piece, when it comes to surfing, surfing insights across games, you can have data and model reuse. Are there, you know, insights that could be drawn from say media storage companies when it comes to capturing game conversations? I mean, I don't know, it just seems to me, or as Yuna was talking about earlier, like whether it's psychologists or people that specialize in the science of learning, I think part of creating a positive ecosystem in the future is to be thinking about what should that ecosystem look like and who's missing and how do we get those people involved? Because I mean, pain points persist across the game process from design, from initiation through design, through execution, mm -hmm. analysis, and then, you know, they persist across games. So, you know, how do you start to plug some of those holes and are there other communities that can do it? And, and I would also add the upstream inputs to war games are something else that if we had a good ecosystem for best practice, the scenarios would have been looked at, right? They wouldn't be just a few scenarios that everyone agrees to, and maybe there are blind spots in that sort of consensus scenario. Again, the dangers of groupthink. So there would be a much more uh, systematic way of looking at different types of scenarios that challenge conventional wisdom and maybe a larger library of those things that could be inputs to different games. There would also be a, a lot more effort and then this is hard with time and resources spent on potential courses of actions, potential solutions, because no war game, no matter how well designed, will save you if they come to you with a bad, um, bad scenario and just bad things to test in, against that scenario. So upstream inputs would also be healthier, but again, resourcing um, challenges. So, so then maybe um, I could tie some of some of that together and say part of the things that we can do as practitioners uh, is to occasionally say no, right? Um, I, that's a hard thing for a lot of organizations and for a lot of individuals. Um, we often try to twist our war games and ourselves into into contorted shapes to make sure that we fit within the bounds. Um, but perhaps we need to start saying, no, that's not an appropriate war game uh, question more often. So, so, so this is where, Jeremy, I would really say that um, working war gamers should add to their stable of tools, formal, other formal methods. Like if it's a group brainstorming session, okay, you can have, you have five different methods to elicit ideas, right? Or if you want um, group consensus, you can talk about divergent and convergent thinking. If the purpose is to get convergent thinking on something, there are there's language around this, right? There's facilitation methods. There are um, structured ways of doing it. Like if you go to liberatingstructures.com, there are a lot of uh, group techniques uh, to do that. So we that's why I am arguing we need to be more precise in our language. So even if it's not adjudicated game, you say, it sounds to me like you want everyone to hear everyone's perspective. So this kind of format for your workshop sounds like what, that's what you need. And the, here have been the use cases for that kind of format. And here are the advantages and disadvantages for you for something like alternative futures analysis, versus um, something like quadrant crunching, right? Because again, there is a lot written on those other methods. And if you can talk about the stable of futures methods uh, and the purposes, like the more exact we can be about the the the, the sort of um, thing and it, what it, the method and what it produces, the better for wargaming because it takes the pressure off of, off of it to be everything, all things to everyone. And if you look in a lot of these methods, they were oftentimes a community of practice just around those methods that we can also get um, a lot of uh, tips and practice from as well. So I feel like war gamers are just too much in isolation and don't look at the, right? They turn their nose up at other things and say, oh, that's not a war game. That's not, that's, that's, that's Biogsat, right? Bunch of guys sitting around a table. But in place of Biogsat, there are a bunch of facilitated methods and we should be professionals and offer those as well. So I have a I have a question for everyone. So you know, if the wargaming community needs to get better at saying no, um, how do you manage sponsors that are starting to ask for war games that are kind of these? I would characterize them as hybrid war games. So they involve human input, 
um, on, you know, in a competition or combat, but they're leaning more into modeling in sim in a way that hasn't been traditionally done before. So they're, and the thing is, they're not asking for a specific problem. They're asking for these digital solutions. So they're asking for digital war games, things like that. So how do we engage with that kind of community? Or do you wait for them to ask for a problem where you have these kind of bespoke games emerge, like for say, Mosaic Warfare, where they're designing a tool just for that specific war game to deal with autonomy. Is there a way to better engage with those game sponsors um, to make sure that they're actually developing solutions that answer analytic problems, or is this something you say no to? So I would suggest that, so all of us war gamers, in my opinion, need to know what, what we can and can't do. Uh, I know in my organization, we there are plenty of things that we simply can't do, right? We don't have um, that that deep um, simulation capability where we could bring in, where, where we can design a war game within our typical war game budgets. Um, and, and we don't have, we have, we have benches of analysts, but not war game sim designers, right? Um, so when that has happened, what, what we've typically done is, is essentially said, well, that's not a service that we can provide. And I think one of the, the problems about the arcane bureaucracy of budgeting that is the DOD is that it becomes almost impossible for us to say, we can't provide that service, but if you want that service, then let us work with somebody who can help provide that and, and bring these together. And, and I think that becomes, uh, especially with the, with, the, um, uh, with the timeline that we typically tend to have with these projects and the decision makers, tying those things together has become a challenge uh, and that I don't know how to, to overcome. But I think we could do probably do better about instead of saying, which I, which I, to your point, instead of saying no, can we say, I, that's a different problem, and I know how to help you solve it otherwise, right? Yeah. So yeah, I think uh, I think sort of partnerships and coalition building, which is sort of like what you're what you're discussing, like that that can be a bridge to a more productive no, you know, than than a sort of a a simple end of, to a conversation. So you know, come back to me when you have something more mature. Um, you know, another answer, and I don't think, um, Jennifer, I, I don't think it, it gets specifically at sort of the, the, the sort of the data, but I mean, the, um, the precise question you asked with respect to sort of these hybrid war games, but, but it, the answer could um, be relevant to that. And, you know, it's that if you come across a sponsor that has an analytical problem like to war game, but you don't think they're at the point yet where they've fleshed it out to the point where, you know, you can build a game around the idea. This isn't how the business has worked in my experience, but I think it's a place it should go is that, you know, you should try to establish and have the capability to establish a long-term partnership with that customer to help mature their analysis, right? To, to get the ideas they're working on to the point where, you know, now we can insert them into a credible cycle of research. Um, and in, a lot of cases, like I, and I may be wrong about this, but my perception has been that there are sort of analysts like myself that have some background using war games and, and designing them, but aren't like a professional producer of, of, of war games day in and day out. And then there's another cluster that, you know, we produce war games um, day in and day out. Um, but, you know, we're really focused on that and we don't do a lot of long-term analysis, right? Like we sort of give you insights and that analysis is carried on elsewhere. Sort of having you know, both a deep analytical capability and a deep war game design capability in the same organization or on the same team so that you can sort of have a total life cycle of support, you know, on a given problem set, I think it could help overcome that problem, right? Um, so if you can accelerate their path to maturing their, you know, idea, say about a given, like get, get, get a given notion of an operational concept mature enough that you could war game it, you know, build an order of battle around it. Um, if you have that capability, th then you don't have to say no. You, you can say, not yet, let's do this first. And I feel like we need a flow chart for action officers titled, do I need a war game? Or at I, least I, aim yet, you know? Yeah. Uh, so we are running close to end of our time. Uh, so we've got, we'll throw one final question out there for the panel. Um, do you normally have any game policy for dealing with situational awareness so that a complete loss of that capability would not stop the whole game? So I think for this question is getting at, right, um, 
So I don't know if we were talking about the player's situational awareness or situational awareness within the context of the game, right? Um, but I think if we're talking about situational, the ability to develop situational awareness within the game and players that suddenly no longer have access to things like information and ISR, um, are there game mechanisms or game policies for um, incorporating that within the context of the game? Thoughts from the panel? I, I, I don't know if this could also touch on command and control, right? I have not done a lot of games that focus on command and control, but that is something where situational awareness might impact that. But people in the community do do uh, double blind games. So in some cases, the point of the game is what you do with limited information, but um, I'm not, uh, that's all I can offer. From from a non from non game perspective, reading the question again, uh, if we're talking about things like distributed gaming, uh, I think there was a great panel on that yesterday, uh, potentially the first or second session, um, that was talking about how do you develop platforms that deal with um, situational awareness of games and what's going on in the game, uh, and then the what I, the only thing I would add for the distribu distributed game perspective is always make sure that there is a uh, that you have a pace plan, primary, alternate, contingency, emergency. Uh, we've had complete lack of communications failures uh, in some of our games, and need to resort to email or secondary methods, um, uh, or or physically moving people from one building to another building in order to maintain continuity of the war game, which which has been a challenge. So uh, expect technology to really fail on you. Um, with our last final couple of minutes, um, any final parting words from around the, the panel? Um, final thoughts about, about your article, about anything that we discussed, words of wisdom that we can all take away with us. Uh, let's start with Shane. How about you? Anything to add? Uh, no words of wisdom to add. Uh, fresh out of those, but you know, it's been great talking with all of you. Um, you know, yeah, I think it, it was a super interesting conversation. I learned a lot. You know, I left with a lot of questions to to, to mull over. So, uh, you know, great conversation, and thanks for having me. Thanks, Jane. Uh, Yuna. Uh, just um, the final comment. We can't just assume that if we war game, regardless of how we're defining war gaming, that good things will follow. And I think we've discussed some of both the larger um, institutional and cultural challenges to that. So this is all something we have to be very cognizant of because the worst case, right, is in a few years, people are like, well, we tried wargaming and it didn't work, so it doesn't work as a tool. So that's something we want to be very careful with. Jennifer. I don't know if this is a big thought, but I guess I would caution people when they're thinking about designing games or when you're thinking about future war to shy away from or avoid thinking that things are new. Uh, very rarely are things actually new. There are always interesting comparisons you can draw from the past and things that can inform how you structure a question or structure a game. So um, yeah, like history can be a useful tool. I realize science fiction can be too, but I'd, I'd go for history before the science fiction. Thanks. Uh, and I'll just close by thanking our panel. Uh, this has been a very great discussion. Uh, I really appreciate your, your thoughts. Uh, and thanks to all the, the Discord and the Connections Online community. Uh, you had some really good questions, uh, but stoked some really good conversation as, as well. So thank you very much to our plan panelists. Thank you to the organizers of Connections Online. Thank you to Armchair Dragons for supporting this. Uh, and thank you to the Discord community for having a great conversation. I really look forward to, to going back through those chats uh, to, to see if, uh, what you've all said about all the great things that, that we talked about here. So thanks to the panelists again. Thanks to everybody out there again. And I will see you next time. <laughs>